Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Center for Southeast Asian Studies Friday Lecture Series. I'm Laura Rosick. I direct the center here, and we're happy to have you join us here this Friday. I want to acknowledge our co-sponsors up front, the Department of Anthropology, Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, the Program in International and Comparative Studies, and of course, the International Institute. And before we start today, I also want to acknowledge um, funding from the U.S. Department of Education National Resource Center grant that funds a lot of our events and outreach. We have a few events coming up that you may be interested in. Um, in this winter, when it's kind of nice sometimes to step back and look, do something a little bit different, we'll be, we have a few film screenings. On Friday, February 12th, we'll be screening Ghost Tape Number 10 and have a Q&A with the director. Uh, this is an interesting film about the weaponization of Buddhist end of life beliefs by the American military during the Vietnam War. Definitely look that up. And if you're interested, please attend. Um, it's interesting, a very interesting and compelling documentary. We're also partnering with the Department of Environmental Health Sciences to have a film screening of a village called Versailles. And we'll have some faculty from Tulane University, Cam Tam Tran and Mark Van Landingham will talk a little bit about this. It's about the Vietnamese community in New Orleans, the largest Vietnamese community outside of Vietnam, and their approaches to handling Hurricane Katrina and fighting off uh, landfill in East New Orleans in Versailles um, after Katrina. So that will be Thursday, February 18th at a special time. Of course, we'd love to see you there. And today is a really fun Friday lecture series for me and for everybody here in the Center for Southeast Asian Studies as we welcome Scott Stonington to talk a little bit about his new book, uh, The Spirit Ambulance, Choreographing End of Life in Thailand. And for those of you who don't know Scott, he's very familiar to our CIS community. Um, he's an MD, PhD physician anthropologist. Um, he's a practicing physician at U of M. He practices primary care at a community health center in Ypsilanti and hospital medicine at the VA. His anthropological research is in Thailand and in the United States. He also is the lead editor of a New England Journal of Medicine series on case studies in social medicine. And that's the only series uh, in a major clinical journal devoted to social theory. And he's a really busy guy being a physician and um, we were just talking, teaching a few courses. So we're really pleased to be able to welcome him here today to talk with us. So um, with that, Scott, I'll let you start your presentation. And thanks again for um, coming and sharing your book with us. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so fun to see this list of people in the participant list. Um, and so actually, before we got start get started, um, for most of this talk, the chat will actually be uh, closed, but we've left the chat open and I'm hoping that you all will type where you are coming from because one of the very few good things about COVID is that we're actually able to connect over these great distances. And I'm kind of wondering whether anybody's in Thailand or anywhere else. So if you wouldn't mind, so I can see your names pop up, um, put where you are physically into the chat. And I'm wondering, Jessica, is the chat actually open yet? Okay, here we go. We have Queens and Madison, Wisconsin. Ooh, that's awesome. Ann Arbor, Oakland, California. Oh, now they're really pouring in. Germany, Bangalore, Queens. Wow, Sio Township. Some of these are um, lots of Michigan places. Columbus, Ohio. Um, more Queens, San Francisco, Illinois. Muskegon, Michigan. Okay. Thanks everybody. No one has popped up from Thailand, but hopefully hope, sound, look, looking at the list of people, I, um, there are quite a few fabulous and um, Thai, Thailand scholars here. So um, hopefully we'll get a chance to connect about this. All right, so while people, you can keep throwing those in there and I'll notice them. Berlin, I see, that's amazing. Okay, so um, at some point here, Jessica will probably close the chat because that's part of the design is that we're gonna end up doing Q and A at the end and we need to have the chat closed in order to set that up. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, give me one sec. All right. So as Laura mentioned, I'm here today to talk a little bit about my book, The Spirit Ambulance. And 
um, having never written a book before. Um, giving book talks is a really awkward thing because you have to pick this this vault, this this object that for me I worked on for a decade or more that has so many parts to it and figure out what of it to talk about. Um, and the book overall is ultimately about how major life transitions, in this case, late aging and the end of life, are changing as the result of the globalization of biomedicine. Um, so it's about themes of technology and expert knowledge as it's moving around the globe, um, but it's also about really deeply local things to Thailand. It has a big section about Thai politics and how medicine got embroiled in politics in Thailand. Um, but for today, I decided to pick one through line to just to talk about, and it's just one of many. And the one I decided to talk about today is the relationship between the material and the immaterial in religious life. So for those of you who um, know a lot about Thailand, this is going to be a very familiar topic because in Thai Buddhism and actually in Thai social life in general, um, tr tr transducing things is sort of the technical semiotic term for it. Changing things from material form to immaterial form is a big part of what religious life is about. And I have here a picture um, of the, the sort of classic iconic image of monks chanting or meditating or praying um, with these white threads called saisin that um, are sort of like electric wires for spiritual power that is generated through these kinds of activities. And these, these threads carry this power and it, it makes the power move from material objects. So people come and donate things to monks, then the white threads will be attached to that through the monks' hands where they're chanting. And then you can see a picture on the right where um, the threads will then take them back to material objects that can get imbued with this kind of spiritual power. So this is not, this is an old, this is an old topic in religious studies in Thailand. But I thought I'd talk about it today because some of what happens in the book, The Spirit Ambulance, is exploring how modern, modern that's not a good word, how biomedicine and particularly hospital medicine has gotten tangled up in exactly this type of activity of transducing between material and immaterial forms. So the book takes place, like many people who study Thailand, it takes place in Northern Thailand in Chiang Mai. And for those of you who don't know Thailand, Chiang Mai is this very dense, getting busier and dirtier urban metropolis, um, but it's surrounded by the mountains of northern Thailand with rice fields and um, going very deep into the mountains toward Burma. And Thailand has, for a little bit of background, Thailand has a fabulous public health system. It has like, you know, if you were to take the quality of a public health system and compare it to the GDP of a place, it has one of the best public health systems in the world. And part of that has been over the last 30 years, a very rapid ramp up of super high tech medicine, um, such that people at the end of life have available to them and the decision makers about their end of life, their physicians and their nurses and their families have available to them intensive care medicine. Um, so today we're going to talk about the material life of the intensive care unit, about mechanical ventilators and tubes and machines and medications and blood draws. And we're going to ask the question of how that material life is connected to some of this transduction of forms between material and immaterial things that I mentioned happening in Thai Buddhism. So part of what's happened is that the ICU has gotten tangled up in an ethical framework, an imperative that people have, where children owe their elders a debt of life for having been given a body at birth. And sometimes it's expressed as that, you know, beni, beni, chi, wit, like I am, I am indebted and it's a life debt that I have. The people that I took care of in the hospital, some of them formulated it this formally and some didn't formulate it that, that formally. But a lot of people talked about the ICU as this place where they were paying back the debt of life. And in fact, the first family that I took care of in the ICU in Thailand had just found out that their father um, was really crashing and not likely to survive his, his injuries in multiple organ failure. And I asked them, if this isn't going anywhere and it isn't going to save his life, have you thought of ending treatment? And they said, no way, we would never think of ending treatment because we are paying back our debt of life to him. And they drew me a table 
I asked them, I was like, what do you mean by paying back your debt of life? But, and they drew me a table, breaking their father's body down into its component parts, which are based on the four elements that show up in a lot of the Vedic religions, earth, air, fire, and water. And in this case, those correspond to the body of flesh, blood, breath, and warmth. Um, and they were able to say, they didn't really talk much about warmth, so this is their table that just used the first three. They were able to talk about the technologies of the ICU and how they were each paying back a part of the body to their elder. So the NG tube through the nose was paying back flesh. Um, he was getting dialysis or kind of a kind of blood exchange that was going on and getting blood, um, and getting transfusions. And so all of this was transferring different components of the body. But for them, the most important was the endotracheal tube, the tube that connects life support to the lungs of their father. Because to them, they were explaining that the breath is the last of the elements of the body to separate from the spirit. And so it's sort of the most important and vital life force that one could transmit. And um, since we're in sort of a, a, a Southeast Asian studies, Thai studies context, I can, I can go into more detail and geek out about this. But um, in Thailand, people, a nickname for, for children, for young children, is my little blood clot. And the reason is because, at least in Northern Thailand where I was, people talk about a, a child as born out of a blood clot from mother and a blood clot from father. And the gift of that very physical material piece of life um, incurs a debt that has to be paid. So this debt of life, it's not just about taking care of somebody and loving them. It's a physical thing. And the physical thing that is being transferred is life objects itself. It's life itself, but contained in these material things that's paying back this very old spiritual debt. So lots of people talk about using the ICU in this way, in this process-oriented way to pay back the debt of life. At the same time, however, for many people, dying in the ICU is a terrible thing. And the reason is because hospitals are haunted by hungry spirits with unresolved issues with the living that they need to work out. And this image I'm showing you here is actually, uh, it's actually from a, a poster from a, uh, a pretty famous Thai um, horror film. But it was shown to me by a medical student. Um, I was going on a med student rotation. We were driving out to a rural part of Chiang Mai province to go to practice medicine at this very remote hospital. And one of the med students said to me, are you scared? And I said, well, yeah, I'm scared. I'm going to go try to practice medicine in Thai, which is just a generally really bad idea. Um, and he said, no, are you scared of the ghosts? And he pulled out this photograph to show me as proof that there were ghosts. And you can sort of see this sepia tone color to it, which is sort of classic for Thai horror movies, but it's also a little bit how these, some of these rural hospitals look because the walls in a tropical place kind of um, yellow and, and age over time. So hospitals are places where bad deaths happen and bad deaths generate unhappy ghosts with unresolved issues that makes them stick around rather than get reborn immediately into their next transition because they have unresolved sticky karmic issues with the living um, that they have to stay around to try to, 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 to manifest. The problem with these spirits is that there's, um, and we can get to this a little bit later with a the Thai vision of karma has this kind of interpersonal stickiness to it, where if you're born here, even if it's not your own, if you die here, I'm sorry, if you die in the hospital, even if these aren't your own issues that are making these unhappy ghosts, they might pollute you. They might kind of stick to you and pull you down and, and keep you here and create sort of an unhappy existence for you. So um, people don't want to die in the hospital, at least the elders 15 years ago who I took care of who were dying were really afraid of dying in the hospital. The home, on the other hand, is an ideal place to die for all of the opposite reasons. There have not been any bad deaths there. And in fact, the home has been full of all of this positive spiritual activity through a lifetime. Some of the, what, you know, Buddhist studies scholars have called the feminists, the, fe the, the female side of, of, of Buddhism, which is often ignored in the very male-centric studies of Sangha-oriented Buddhism. But things like raising children and making food and caregiving for one's elders and all of these very positive, more domestic things that generate a lot of positive spiritual consequences, positive merit. 
So here is a woman that I spent a lot of time with at the end of her life. And she had been in the hospital in the ICU and then had come home from there and was laying in a, on this mattress on the floor of her living room. And she, you can see that she's surrounded, the head of her bed has all these bags that are full of her favorite possessions. And those are there so that at the moment of her death, she doesn't miss anything. So that there's nothing that would make her kind of cling and wonder where it was that might make her stick to this world a little bit more, generate that kind of karmic stickiness. And the people, the women sitting around her, that had her um, are also there. Their job is to be there so that they are not missed at the moment of death either. And then there's all this stuff that's happening at the bedside um, that is love and caregiving and people asking each other's forgiveness. And there's a process where people are trying at least formally, now this didn't always go well, but they're trying to sort of burn through as much of their karmic entanglements, their stickiness between them that they can before the person dies and moves on to their next rebirth. So we have this situation where there's this debt of life People talked about the debt of life as, you know, it used to be paid at home, just like you see in this scene. But now that Thailand has really hyper-technologized and created this very high-tech biomedical health system, that debt has moved to the hospital. So we have to take people to the hospital and we have to push their end of life as long as we can in the ICU. And then we have to not die in the ICU and we have to get home as quickly as we can. So this generates something that is the title of the book, which is The Spirit Ambulance, which is when things get close to being precipitously over in the ICU and somebody's at risk of dying, there's this mad rush to take somebody home so that they take their last breath in a spiritually advantageous place. And it's an ambulance that's not so much for saving somebody's body as it is for making sure that their spirit gets to the right place. So, this is now a very idiosyncratic part of my research, but at the hospital where I worked in Chiang Mai, the spirit, it was a public hospital and people didn't have much money. So the um, using an actual ambulance with hired health personnel was not possible. So the spirit ambulance was actually a side business run by the hospital gate guard. You know, when you go to go to hospitals in many countries, there's like a, a guard with an arm that you drive up and before they lift the arm, you get information. And so this was the hospital gate guard. And he ran a side business where he would be doing his, gate, his guard duties and then he would get a call by cell phone from the ICU nurses that there was somebody who needed to be transported home. And he, here we are loading, um, loading one of uh, the patients that I followed for a while into the back of his pickup truck. And he had outfitted his pickup truck with two oxygen tanks and a mattress. And he had also learned through personal experience and through a bunch of study with monks who were experts in the metaphysics of death, that um, if somebody were to die on the way, it would be especially bad for their spirit because their spirit would get lost en route somewhere and who knows what kinds of evil forces might trap them there or that they might get stuck to on their journey trying to get home. And he had learned that um, the thing that makes the spirit want to separate from the body is the beginning of the process of decay of the body itself. And so um, if we were driving along the way and um, somebody were to die in en route, then he had learned that the best practice was to stop, go from you know going 100 kilometers an hour through traffic and weaving and doing whatever we could to get home as fast as possible, to stopping on the side of the road and embalming somebody to slow the process of decay of their body to keep their spirit from separating from the body. And he had jury rigged an embalming apparatus out of a motorcycle tire pump and a high school chemistry beaker set. Um, where he would take a motorcycle tire needle and cannulate a vein in somebody's arm. And then he had a beaker that he had filled with embalming fluid and he would use the motorcycle tire pump to fill their vascular system with embalming fluid to slow the decay process so that the spirit would stay close to the body. And then we would, um, then we would talk to the spirit to make sure that it stayed connected with us. And the family that was often in the back of the spirit ambulance truck would say things like, we're passing the 7-Eleven where you bought your cigarettes and um, oh, there's the soccer field where you had your soccer club as a kid, but you got in those fights and as much personal vivid detail as possible so that this spirit would um, come with us on the way home. And sometimes this whole process went really well. And one case that I talk a lot about in the book um, 
we went um, five and a half hours deep into the mountains in northern Thailand to get home. And when we got home, we carried this old, older woman up into her house, and her house was full of people who'd been alerted by cell phone that we were about to arrive. Um, and they had prepared all these things that were designed to make the moment of passing have the right feeling tone to it. So people had prepared her favorite food and fed her bites of it, um, and people had prepared things that they wanted to say. And when we got up into this house, um, that all happened very quickly, and the, the woman that we, we had with us was still attached to endo her endotracheal tube. My job along the way had been to bag ventilate her to keep her spirit attached to her body as we went. Um, but then as soon as we arrived, we, the, the job was very quickly to take out the endotracheal tube so that she would die quickly and peacefully um, in her home. So sometimes this went well. And sometimes all of this that I've described as this just like beautiful thing where everybody's in harmony and everybody knows the script and everybody knows how it should go. Sometimes this was all a total crash and burn disaster. Sometimes people would wake up out of their general anesthesia that had been used to keep them sedated for their life support and they would wake up into a body that was beyond death because it had been kept beyond death by the intensive care unit and it was a painful place to be and everything would get this, this atmosphere that we were trying to craft of the perfect state of mind right before dying would totally collapse and it would be a scene of chaos and suffering. Um, and sometimes the families couldn't agree on this and should we stay in the hospital and should we go and were there ghosts or weren't there ghosts? And so I don't want to give a portrait of all of this as totally perfect and harmonious. But what it was was a kind of choreography where there was a script for how all of this movement needed to happen in order to create a good death um, to facilitate this passage of the spirit with the least karmic stickiness. So that was a long narrative about, um, that was sort of stuff from one of the chapters of the book. Um, but the reason I went into all of that is to start talking, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but in some slightly more unsettling ways about how Western biomedicine or just by the biomed, you know, in Thailand, it doesn't feel very Western because it's so deeply grown in Thailand and is also super high tech. And just, I mean, this is like one of the best health systems in the world with these fabulous hospitals, how all of this material stuff of biomedical intervention has gotten repurposed or purposed for these um, processes of transducing between material and immaterial forms to try to shepherd this spirit um, with all of the right stuff attached to it or not attached to it more accurately into the next life. Um, and some of this happened through the spiritual um, nature of or what has been imbued in the actual physical components of life. And I'm, you can imagine that there's a whole conversation in Thailand that I won't be talking about today, but that's about organ transplantation and how each organ has its own uh, spirit and its own karmic history that it brings with it if you were to put it into somebody else's body. But I wanted to take a moment to talk about another aspect of all of this, um, where there's transduction between material and immaterial forms um, that involves the actual nature of who we are as beings ourselves. And um, this just for a little technical jargon, I'm taking us into a realm called complex personhood, which is a way of thinking about how people um, might be made up of other complex combinations of things, including other beings. So I'll start this section by talking about a man who I took care of. Um, I mean, when I say take care of, I was at this time I was doing the work for this book. I was a medical student and an anthropology student, so I wasn't really doing a lot of direct clinical care. Um, but a man that I spent a lot of time with who had um, this invasive rectal cancer that I imagined to be really painful. And but he was this super jolly old guy and he seemed to be really coping with all of this very well. And I asked him how he was doing that. How was he making sense of it and staying in good spirits? And he said, oh, that's easy. My illness is a jiao gum nai wain. And I'm gonna teach you, I just said that in Thai because don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. I'm gonna teach you what that term means. But first I wanna tell you what he said about it. Cause when I heard it, I didn't understand what he was saying. And he said, when I was young, I used to raise buffalo. In fact, I raised buffalo my whole life. What you'll see in a minute, why, we, why there's a buffalo on the slide. And when I raised buffalo, I used to put rings through their noses and I would yank on them to get them to go the direction that I wanted. And last week when I was in the hospital, 
they put a tube in my nose. It was a nasal cannula and he also had a nasogastric tube. And every time I turned, it yanked on my nose, just like I used to yank on the buffalo. That's how I know that my illness is the buffalo who have come back to work out an old debt. And I now, through my illness, get to ask for their forgiveness. I know this because as soon as I let go into my illness and know that I'm interacting with the buffalo, then all of that suffering that comes along with it loosens up a little bit. And he stood up, and I can't really stand up where I am in my teeny little office, but he stood up and his legs were bowed outward like the, like open parentheses, like no, like closed parentheses like this. And he said, I used to ride the buffalo all the time and now my legs are bowed and my hips hurt and my knees hurt and my ankles hurt. All of this is how I know that the buffalo have come back to work out this old debt with me. I met another man who was paralyzed in his right arm. And his right arm also had horrible neuropathic pain in it. And I was actually interviewing him for a later, a later project on pain management. And I wasn't really thinking much about his disability but I just asked him the story of how his arm came to be paralyzed. And he told me the following story. When he was young, he was part of a gang and a gang of boys that were sort of brash and rude and hilarious. And they used to do these pranks. And one of their favorite games was one that he had invented. And he used to pull a dog from his neighborhood, a stray dog onto his motorcycle and ride it around the neighborhood. And it was like, seemed to be just very slightly fun for the dog, but mostly scary. And it was kind of dangerous because the dog could have bit him. And it was all this huge game that he thought was really fun. Until one day he let Holt go of, a, of the dog and it fell on the ground and it slid into, um, slid into a, the side of the road. And then it got up and it was clearly hurt like it had broken a leg and it limped off. And he sort of, it was a kind of a, an awakening moment for him when he stopped being quite such a, a bad kid. Um, and then a year before I talked to him, now he was in his 20s, he was riding his motorcycle late at night and it was through the sort of forested area, rural area, and there was thick fog. Um, and while he was driving, he couldn't see very well, but a dog ran out of the forest. And in order to miss it, he swerved and he thinks he clipped the dog a little bit, but he swerved and hooked his tire on the side of the road. And his motorcycle went down and he landed on the side of his neck, which pulled his neck from his shoulder and ripped all of the nerves that go from the spinal cord out down his arm. And he skidded and came to a stop on the edge of the road, sort of like that dog had many years before. And he lay there all night unable to move his arm, unable to really get himself up um, until morning. And all night he could hear the, the sound of the stray dogs in the forest barking and braying and doing something in the forest. And he said, that's how I know that this injury is the dog that has come back to work out this old karmic debt with me. And sometimes the dog comes to me in my dreams and I can feel it chewing on my arm. Sometimes it's like the dog is just there inside my arm chewing from the inside. So he used this word, and I translate this word as a karma master, but it's kind of worth breaking it down into its component parts because it's this compound of four words. So here are some of the things it's made up of. It's made up of the word which is like the owner or master or something. Like if you have a landlord or, you're, you know, somebody who owns something just in regular life, you'd say, you know, jiao nai. Um, gum means karma. Wain is to return something or pay back a debt. And it's sort of used in real formal settings. But wain gum, wain gum in particular means to pay back a karmic debt. Like to, you know, sort of that thing that in English and colloquial understandings of Buddhism, you might say is to like burn off old karmic, old karma. So all of this smashed together means a being that has come from a past life to work out an old debt that you have incurred with it by behaving poorly toward that being. So why did I go into all of that if what we want to talk about is this kind of transduction between forms, material and immaterial? Well, part of it is because um, this, this man, Jonah Watt, who talked about his arm, you know, he didn't talk about it as 
um, there was this abstract spiritual force that came forward in time and somehow magically made this thing happen to me at night. There was an actual dog. It wasn't the same dog that was the dog from before. It was a different dog who was sort of partly the former dog that came out and actually clipped his motorcycle. And then he talked about the dog coming to him in his dreams and the dog in his arm as though the animal nature had become part of him, had become part of who he was. So this makes me think of, I don't usually do a lot of citations to other, other, other stuff when I do talks because it just makes it a little bit of an academic insider conversation, but I wanted to bring up one of my favorite books in anthropology, which is called Life Beside Itself by Lisa Stevenson. And in it, she's doing an ethnography of, of Inuit um, in, in Northern Canada. And she's part of this sort of suicide prevention program and has a chance to interact with lots of people around questions of life or death and these very deep sort of metaphysical things. And she opens the book with a conversation with a friend um, who uh, sees a raven land on, a, on the porch outside of their house and says, you know, I keep being confused. I'm not sure whether that raven is my uncle or not. And she opens the book with this because of this sort of uncertainty and doubt, but also this sense that um, people are moving in and out of different forms in different lives. And then she talks about how in the place where she's living, people are given many different names. And um, one of their names is their soul name. That is a name that is given after one of their ancestors. And that ancestor becomes part of who they are. So that people will, you know, a grandmother will talk to her granddaughter and refer to the granddaughter by the grandfather, dead grandfather's name, and just treat, treat the little girl as though she is the dead grandfather because there's part of the dead grandfather actually physically in her, in characteristics of her personality and in her body and the way she. Um, the way she moves through the world. So I bring this up because um, there, that some of this transduction of material and immaterial is about how people are using the ICU. We went through all these material objects that people are using to pay back this debt of life and changing a material thing into an immaterial thing. But even though this was kind of a rare idea, some people started to talk about the immaterial and material actually as converting different parts of their own self, parts of their own body, so that they were in a way, these kind of combinations of beings that had been assembled through the sticky force of karma through time. So for me, this raises a question um, that I, I bring up a little bit in the book, which is, how is ethical action possible when one is already always partly someone else? Where we're not just connected to each other, but we are kind of, that the force of karma is so strong that it makes us so bound together that we actually need to pay back debts for parts of our own body by giving parts of bodies to someone else. Um, or where we might actually be assembled as a, as, a, as, a, as a set of different beings that are all held together in our personhood. And I won't go get into it too much. I'm looking at time, but um, you know, Western ethical theory is deeply, deeply dependent on the idea of bounded individuals being themselves and being the things that are responsible for their own actions in the past. Whether you're thinking about virtue ethics where you're developing the virtues that make you able in some context to make good decisions or whether you're talking about um, principles that you follow and then have to follow the consequences of or decisions that you make. So some of what I end up, so this is, you know, as I said at the beginning, when you give a talk about a book, you have to pick what to talk about. And I decided that um, we're all like so used to thinking really concrete medical things that I would go into something that was metaphysical and um, a little bit more out there. So there's much more in than this in the book. But the thing that I'm talking about today is connected to the overall theme of the book, which is this concept of choreo choreographing the end of life, of trying to do this process, this movement, this dance, getting the right, the right things in the right place at the right time as a way of thinking about the good death and as a way in to thinking about how the good death might be changing as Western biomedicine becomes a more and more imbricated part of how everyone manages death and dying around the world. So part of this in Thailand was that a lot of the ethics about how to do the end of life was really about 
how to get the right characters on the scene, to get the right elements in the room. So for example, if you were gonna be in the hospital, that's a place that's just full of all sorts of bad things, um, that's full of hungry ghosts and spirit, a sort of sticky metaphysical contagion, then might as well just get out of that space, right? And get into a space that is better. But that all spaces are inhabited by multiple things, by spirits, by karmic residues, by this sort of material immaterial hybrid. Um, so some of the work at the end of life is about, um, about taming some of those evil elements that are, that you can't get away from that are there. So if you're at home and you have these old unresolved sticky relationships with family members, then there are a set of, of, of rituals at the end of life that involve really formal ways of asking for forgiveness and giving for forgiveness, trying to undo all of the stickiness of what is, is right there. And then some people talked about needing to make peace with their with parts of themselves, with their past self, for example, that they were still attached to, that was different from their current self, that they that was sick and starting to die, or actions that they had done in the past, or for these few people who talked about these kind of hybrid personhood, actual parts of themselves that were other beings to whom they were beholden, that they owed this karmic debt. These Jiao Gam Nai Wayne, the karma masters that had come back to work out an old debt by inhabiting part of their body in a painful and suffering ridden way. So the question is, if you live in that ethical world where it's all about crafting who, who is there, what is there at the end of life, um, then what does ethical action look like? Bioethics in the West is very focused on um, very focused on decision making and right action and concepts of sort of dilemmas and rights and choices. But a lot of people that I talked to around the end of life were less concerned about that and more about this kind of choreographing the overall environment. And one person I'll talk about briefly was actually not an end of life experience, but was um, a person I got to know very well through a set of trainings on how to to um, use the end of life as a way to sort of further one spiritual practice in Thailand. And he was a medical professional and had grown up in sort of a suburban part of Bangkok and was sort of hyper intellectual and rational. And, um, but he had, had in high school had been diagnosed with a, um, a very, what he called a very mild form of schizophrenia. And he, so he had these voices in his head. And he said that, you know, at, at first, he was really disturbed by these, but and as he first explained it to me when I was getting to know him, he said, um, you know, with a sort of low dose antipsychotics and a, just an ability to get to recognize that they weren't dangerous and weren't gonna do anything bad that he had learned to really cope with them very well. Um, but later, once I got deeper into my field work and I explained what was going on, he said, you know, now it's time for me to tell you what's actually going on with these voices. This voice in my head is the voice of a man who I killed in a past life. And he is here to work out that old debt. And I'd gotten to know him enough at this point that I was able to say, the thing that I'd been wondering most about this kind of hybrid being nature, I said, okay, are they your thoughts or are they his thoughts? And he thought for a moment and he said, you know what, I don't really know. And I don't think it really matters whose thoughts are whose. All that matters is that I forgive him and that he forgive me and that we learn how to have loving kindness and, and act together in a way that is good in the world and resolve all that old sticky stuff. The reason I brought this up is that I asked that question, how is ethical action possible if you're already sort of entangled with the other? And the answer is it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a consistent self, if it is a bounded self, if it's the same all the time or if it's changing all the time, because action is still just totally clear. What needs to happen is this practice of choreographing the package of who you are and where you are and resolving all of it in the most compassionate and loving direction possible. Um, okay, I think I'll stop my talking head part right there um, and open it for Q&A. Laura and Jessica, does that sound like the right way to transition here? That sounds great, yeah. Um, let's see, some of these. 
And actually, yep, I'm going to stop my good. I'm going to stop my screen share so I can. Yeah, I can throw back on my. Thank you so much. I have we have a couple of questions. I have a million questions. Um, so I'm going to start with the ones from the people who don't get to see you as much as I do. Um, Arthur Mangozi, who is from the Center for Russian and East European Studies, um, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Uh, Arthur is a Russian scholar, and the region and Buddhism are quite unfamiliar. Um, so could you please elaborate on the intersection between Buddhist teaching and the medical sciences in Thailand more generally? Um, said, I know that many doctors in America, somewhere around 70%, are practicing Christians. Is there a similar statistic in Thailand? Yeah, so that's a great question, Arthur. So, um, you know, the, the usual statistics thrown around about Thailand are that Thailand is overwhelmingly uh, Buddhist. It's like, I can't actually, I always have to look up the numbers. I think it's something like 94%. Um, and that is often used particularly by Thai friends speaking to foreigners to say that there's this kind of homogeneity of, of thought and, and um, understanding there. And, you know, and everybody in Thailand kind of, I think in elementary school learns, I think that whether it's explicit or not, that there's kind of like a way you talk to foreigners where you're like Thai Buddhists believe, and then you like spout this whole thing that's like the party line <laughs> about what Buddhism is, but it hides this absolutely unbelievable diversity of how people engage with Buddhism in Thailand. Um, from really like esoteric, ascetic, monastic practices to um, forms of ritual that are a really big part of daily life to, um, so I won't get it, you know, that's a, there's a lot of background to really map out all of that stuff. Um, but uh, what I'll say is that most people in the medical profession, and this includes doctors and nurses and, you know, sort of everybody are drawn from a particular for the most part, more urban rather than rural, more middle to upper class rather than lower class. Um, and so there's a particular kind of Buddhism that tends to show up in medical care. Um, and it's interestingly very uh, meditation heavy, even though I would say that most Buddhism in Thailand is not particularly focused on meditation. So there are lots of these conferences for doctors and nurses where they practice meditating and they think, do things like talk about how to use end of life care to further their, their spiritual wisdom, et cetera. So um, it's sort of, I would say it's, it seems like it's mostly through that sort of personal approach to Buddhism from all of the people who are engaged in, in, in medical care. Now, you, if you hang out in a public space anywhere in Thailand, and hospitals are no exception, there's all sorts of, of, of you know, physical stigmata of Buddhism. There are Buddhist statues, and there are shrines where people are making offerings, and there are, um, you know, so all of that, all of that sort of material re religious life is very much a part of hospitals. Um, and then getting to, I won't, you know, we could talk about this for a whole hour, but getting to like, you know, in, in a place that talks about itself as being very homogenous, what does that do in terms of hierarchy and power and understanding? And a lot of that gets into um, stuff around bioethical questions around decision making and how people sort of assume they have the same thing, but it's often an excuse for a kind of paternalistic approach from, from doctors and nurses. Um, okay, I'll stop there because I could talk about that for forever. Well I want to go to the next question, but I just wanted to ask. So it seems to me like my little bit, I'm, I'm obviously not a physician, but even going there and working in cancer clinics and doing cancer studies, the physicians seem to be a lot more open to natural medicine and alternative medicine. And it, there seems to be a much more a harmony. And it sounds like that's what you're explaining with the end of life and Buddhism. Like there seems to be a little bit more harmony with those beliefs in the United States. Would you say that? Well, um, the question of harmony and healthcare in the United States is very complicated. And yeah, we so maybe a, we should compare that. We, 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 well, we have a bioethical system that is designed around, you know, it's essentially designed to be part of, you know, the party line is that bioethics in the U.S. is, 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 is meant to be, um, it's a system that's designed around having a, such a pluralistic place where you can't ever assume, assume you know what anybody wants or needs or would decide. And so it's super autonomy heavy. But a lot of that is also this, this is very legalistic view of decision making where it's like I have rights and I advocate for them and I who has the right to make this decision and it's very much like designed around both creating and resolving conflict. Um, so I would say that, that, that that's just not a big part of, that's not the place where bioethics and this is kind of decision-making comes from in actually most of the world, not to mention Thailand. Um, so, but then the question of sort of harmony with other systems, um, 
comes up a lot when people are asking about the ICU and they're sort of like, okay, well, if the family's paying back this debt of life, what are the doctors and nurses doing? And to some degree, everybody's kind of embroiled in all of this as just part of the, 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 like, the water that they're swimming through. So, um, you know, people will also often, often ask, you know, with this debt of life, do people spend forever in the ICU? And isn't that a huge waste? And why did, have they decided that it's valuable to do that? And some of the answer is that, um, is that ICU stays are actually quite short. And part of it is that people don't want to die in the ICU and the doctors and nurses, it would be a huge bad outcome if somebody who didn't want to die there ended up dying there. So they'll say, okay, we think that it's time. It's time to engage the spirit ambulance and get home or you're not gonna make it. And I would go on the spirit ambulance and then I would come back to the hospital afterward and the nurses would, would corner me and be like, how did it go? Did they make it? And they were checking, just like when you, you know, prescribe a medication and the patient comes back and you're like, okay, did it help? You're like checking your clinical reasoning. They were checking their spiritual, spiritual clinical reasoning um, to try to modify whether they were picking the right time to send people home. So a lot of it is all very, you know, everybody's a part of the same system. And then just since you asked about, you know, alternative healing practices there, um, there is a lot more, you know, China's right next to Thailand, I mean, Thailand's right next to China. So it's like, there's no reason in particular that, you, you know, Western biomedicine rather than Chinese biomedicine should be the thing that's showing up. And in a lot of ways, Chinese biomedicine is, is showing up more and more in Thailand. So a lot of that is like one of the hospitals where I worked most recently has, has an acupuncture clinic where people come in for acupuncture and people are learning herbal medicine. And it's kind of, it, it's, that's obvious, a much more obvious link. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, Ernie King is asking if there are examples of quote unquote good karma coming through as well. A person who is kind to everyone in life receives good things at the end of life as well. And thank you. Yeah, so um, there are sort of two answers to this question. The super esoteric, like um, academic Buddhist answer is that there's not ultimately really any such a thing as good karma because all karma is ultimately sticky and ends up kind of grabbing you. So even, even if you're born into this life and you're rich and it's because you had did good works in the past life and all of the good things that come to you are because of your own behavior, there's still this sort of sense that like, yeah, but it would be even better to not have any of that kind of stickiness, even the good stickiness. But that's a super esoteric answer that I would say is not applicable to many people in Thailand. So people then talk a lot about how, um, you know, of, of course you want, you want to do good things so that then you have good consequences that come from it. And people did talk about really positive forms of hunting and hybridity. Like one person that I took care of who, um, her, her daughter after she died, it, it was a very good death and all of this stuff went really well that I was talking about. And her daughter talked about how after her death, um, she would hear cupboards opening and closing in her house. Um, and she thought that her mom had chosen to stick around for just a little bit longer to give her that cozy feeling that they were still connected, but it wasn't a negative thing that was going to keep her trapped and not have a good rebirth. Um, so that, you know, people talked about all this stuff in a positive way, but in a place where like, you know, saying, oh, you know, I'm rich and I don't have any pain because I am awesome and never did anything bad. Like that is a really bad thing to say that's gonna generate bad karma. So people will, people talk a lot about negative karma and trying to do the right thing to burn it off and people talk a lot less, um, but that's sort of more of a, like a hermeneutics of, of, of self-making and how, you know, what kind of, of um, approach you have to problems and sort of always being in a kind of righteous self-effacing mode. So Arena Vlasova is a first year graduate student at Michigan and thank you for the lecture and asks, what is Thai medical professionals perception of transduction of form? Does this concept affect their decisions regarding choice of treatments and procedures in their patients? That's a great question. And you know, the, I, I've actually never given, I don't really talk much about transduction of form in the book and I've never given the talk with that spin before. Um, and so, you know, I would say that uh, there's a, there's a little bit of a thing where doctors have this like sort of Western rationality mode that they, that's a hat that they put on that they keep kind of protected a little bit from some of the other logic. So I would say that almost all Thai doctors would say, you know, other than the kind of meditation and 
getting happier through time and getting to be a better person through time, they would sort of not allow any of that Buddhist logic into their medical decision making. So, you know, doctors in Thailand are just fabulous. It's like excellent medicine and excellent medical training and just super per like cutting edge protocol. And, you know, so, um, so I would say that they're not talking about, um, they're not really talking about that as explicitly, but then there they are and they're part of these same families. And when their elders are dying, they're paying back their debt of life. And they're so, so it's sort of like, it's one of those things where, you know, belief is doesn't requ require this like totally coherent self that is always internally consistent and never changing. And so people are always like improvising and pulling out different aspects of these things. Um, and I would say that the doctors, when they're talking with patients about that are able to drop right into um, the process of paying back the debt of life and why they might want to get home and the, and the ghosts, you know, I would, I would be there and I came in one day to the hospital and one of the patients I'd been following had been moved to another bed. And I said, why were they moved? And the nurse said, oh, because the family thinks that a constricting ghost sat on his chest last night and kept him from breathing. And they wanted to move a different bed because they think that that was probably the ghost of somebody who died in that bed and they wanted a new place. You know, and she didn't, and, and then I was like, okay, was it a ghost? <laughs> <laughs> and the nurse was like, oh, right, Western rational. She's like, oh, I don't know. And then she got all like flushed, you know. So it's sort of like people move creatively and fluidly in and out of these different systems. And it's only when somebody's there to be like, what's the truth? Believe something the same all the time. Do they get kind of, get kind of worried about how to divide it up? So Manish Mehta asked if these end of life practices are also in neighboring nations like Myanmar, Cambodia, et cetera. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and I'm gonna give a possibly unsatisfying answer, which is that, you know, some of, um, some of the point of this, of this book is working out how to think through like local specificity and universality. And, and you know, normally we don't try to do that in anthropology because it's an impossible thing to do, but the end of life kind of asks for it because there's something about, um, you know, the talk I gave today, in a way to me, it feels like a whole bunch of stuff that was really unfamiliar to me, but there's so many parts of this that feel so familiar. Like people wanna die at home here and people think that hospitals are these like unsacred, icky, weird places. You know, it's like a lot of this stuff is just, it's not really like super specific and local, but it's also not universal. And um, so even within Thailand, um, quite a few of the things that I was talking about are different in central Thailand and in Bangkok than they would be up where I was in this sort of particular social class of people in outside of Chiang Mai. Um, so the answer is going to be kind of like kind of unsatisfying in that you're going to find a lot of these elements in other places. And then there are going to be other things that are really super different. Um, and if I had to speculate on things that are different, of course, there's this like, you know, people for a long time have have written about um, filial piety and the way that family operates and the way the concept of blood and what it holds in it. And um, so I have a feeling that there are going to be versions of that in lots of places around. Um, and then also some of the like general animist approach to things where things can be can be inhabited by spirits that give them part of their um, part of their nature, I'm guessing is going to be really true in lots of places around also. So Daphne Weber, who's a PhD student at Wayne State, has a couple questions. I'm so going to be picky and pick one. Um, Daphne has attended some having a mindful death workshops in Thailand, and was interested oh. in the. I know, I'm like really cool. And interested <laughs> in, in the role playing methods, and her experiences were similar to yours, connecting a role to a previous experience, sometimes surfacing old feelings and emotions, whatever you'd like to call it. How do you think about anthropologists using role playing as a method, especially as it relates to those questions of death, dying, and potentially trauma? Pros and cons. That's, I know that's a big question, but. Yeah. Wow, so Daphne, by the way, that's amazing. You've been to those <laughs> workshops. So, um, you know, thinking and writing about role playing and also experiencing role playing is a, is a super complicated issue. So there's a chapter, so, so for those of you who haven't, haven't encountered the book, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about how there's this kind of new concept of end of life that involves a certain kind of self-making through the process of dying that involves that you know your diagnosis and kind of study it. And it's a whole new movement in Thailand that's a combination of um, global palliative care hospice kinds of ethics and then a super deeply like um, monastic flavored Buddhist approach to studying lived experience. 
Um, and part of how that is manifesting is that people are doing these trainings where they're like trying to face their end of their death um, in a peaceful kind of way. Um, and there's this word, pachu, and there's like a facing, like a confronting or that, that people are doing with their death. So part of how they're doing that in these workshops is through these role-playing exercises where you're trying to imagine yourself like at the bedside of somebody who's dying or you as the person who's dying and some of the stuff that's gonna come up for you and for other people. Um, and the truth, I'll, 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 I'll share just very honestly that it was very hard for me to write about in that section of the book, not for sort of emotional reasons, but because it's so hard to write about role playing in a way that communicates some of the emotion of what it's like to step into that role. So we'd be in these workshops and um, you know, we'd be playing like loved ones of somebody who's dying of cancer and it would like, you'd really get transported into some of those feelings. But when I'm writing, like now I'm imagining myself as this person who feels this, it's just, it feels, it feels very disconnected. Um, so the, that's a long way of saying um, that role-playing as far as, you know, it, empirically my sense from Thailand is that role-playing is a lot of how this new kind of movement is emerging. Um, but it's a pretty weird particular movement in Thailand that's about like actually experiencing things rather than just studying about them or contemplating them. Um, and so I'd say it's not, you know, it's not a big, as far as I can tell, it's not a really huge part of medical training in Thailand. Um, you know, not like, unlike the United States where, you know, working with standardized actor patients and stuff is a really big part of, of it here. So that kind of like um, sort of emotional calibration, learning how to feel and what are the right ways to feel to become a a, a, a tool of compassion and empathy that has the right kind of healing relationship to patients. In Thailand, I feel like that's a, it's, it's kind of like a specialized movement and it's, a, it's actually, if I'm really honest about it, it's kind of a foreign thing that people are importing in various ways um, and then combining really productively with, with Buddhist practices. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea about that. That's so cool. Um, Adeep Amin from Bangalore, thank you for the talk. Um, that's an interesting question. Thank you for going through your process of translation from Thai to English. It's interesting how you embedded that process in the social context, the complexity that you were trying to communicate. And it reminded Adeep of the um, thickle life in your book, which is similarly like translation, deeply embedded and imbricated. Could you speak more as um, to whether translation and ethics as parallel processes came to your mind when you did your field work? Adiv, what a great question. I know. I know, what a great question. So, um, so when I have um, students who are doing ethnography in the United States um, and they're doing all their interviews in English, um, I talk about their speaking the same language as the people they're with as a handicap. And the reason it's a handicap is because, you know, doing this kind of field work and doing anthropology is a very, it's not just like, oh, you know, everybody throws around the word humbling, like as a humbling process. It's not a humbling process, but like a deep humility is actually like an absolutely necessary but not sufficient tool for it. And so this like constant admission that you don't know anything is like really deep at the heart of it. And it's really easy to do that when you're a total idiot in somebody else's language. Because you can just say like, I don't understand that word, explain that word to me. Explain it to me again, I don't get it. You know, it's like, it's so easy to have this excuse of why you need to have every little thing explained at kind of a deep level to you. When you're, you know, when I'm in clinic and my patient's using the word heart attack and I'm using the word heart attack and it's clear we're using them in totally different ways. There's like no easy entry into how to say like, I think we're using this word in a different way, but that doesn't make them feel like they've got it wrong and I've got it right. And, you know, so like so the sameness can be this huge handicap. So that's what came to mind with your question about the ethics of translation, because translate, you know, for me, when I take a term like Jiao Gam Nai Wei, and I'm just like, look, I had no clue. This is how I've assembled some understanding of how this term works, <laughs> right? And um, I, it, it also helps me a little bit because I feel like, you know, I see a few of my, you know, most favorite and fa famous and intimidating Thai scholars in the <laughs> chat, you know, it's like, um, you know, I, I still may not get that word very well, but, but the process of figuring out this much of an understanding has given me a map for a whole bunch of other things. 
Wow, so we're at the end. I just, I was scrolling through the questions and realized it's one o'clock. So we probably, you have a ton of questions. We'll share the chat with you as you can see. Um, and I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. As I said, they've just been pouring in, um, which means it was a great talk. And again, if you're interested, we're doing ghost tape number 10 in a few weeks, which talks about weaponizing the end of life um, by the American military. But let's come back to focus on this. It was a great talk, Scott. Thank you so much. It's um, We really enjoyed it. And we, um, wow, thank read the so book. Much, everybody. The I book. Love, yeah, I love thank you for coming. Questions. They're all so, so rich and interesting. All right, goodbye, everybody. See you in a few weeks. Thanks again for coming to our talk.